Well, cool. All right. Well, uh, let's kick it off then. So uh, here, I'll put myself front and center here for a sec. Hey, everyone. So welcome to Speakeasy JS. Um, we're going to be uh, having some cool talks this week. We got Ma Matias and Andrew who are going to be sharing some of their uh, cool hacks with us. So um, we're going to start with Matias's talk. Um, before we get started, though, I'm going to have just a little uh, just a bit of info about what this meetup is trying to be. So we're trying to focus on mad science, hacking, and experiments. So any kind of JavaScript projects which are at the cutting edge, which are pushing forward, you know, what is possible. And uh, some, sometimes we'll just have stuff that's uh, weird and cool and interesting. So uh, I'm just going to try and keep it fun. And we're going to do it every Friday at 4 p.m. So uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, keep coming every week if you want more of this uh, same stuff. So uh, that's it for my little intro. Um, let's uh, let's uh, give it over to Matthias. So uh, Matthias is going to yeah. be sharing uh, stuff about uh, Hyperview with us. So. Take it away, Matthias. Thank you, Faraz. Let me just share my screen. <clears throat> Should be sharing it now. Um, well, it's definitely in the. It's definitely it in, the the, uh, in the. In the. There it is. You Got see it. it? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely going to present something in the math science and experiment and hacking section. So I think it, it fits pretty well. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about new project I've been working on the last uh, couple of weeks together with Paul and Andrew uh, called Hyper-B. I made this little fun logo for it today. Uh, so <clears throat> Hyper-B is, a, is, a, is basically an experimental peer-to-peer -peer streaming B tree uh, with like really fast inserts for like a peer-to-peer -peer thing and, and uh, really fast and low latency um, uh, uh, retrievals and iterations. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. And also I have some demos because you can't do math science without demos. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm, I'm Matthias. I go by Macintosh online. Uh, I do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer and distributed system stuff. Uh, I actually did a lot of bit term stuff with Rust in the past and uh, that's been really fun. That's kind of how I got started in this uh, fun uh, math science space. Um, so yeah, check it out and check all, all all the stuff is on the GitHub and uh, on the Twitter. So also, feel free to reach out and send me a DM if you have any questions. So, uh, Hyperbees, you know, it's, 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 it's a project. Uh, it's a peer to peer thing. You know, the peer thing is about having a peer, but it's also have, about having more peers. And it's actually about having a tons of peers uh, and having all those peers talk to each other and do something interesting. Um, <clears throat> Interesting thing this thing does is it kind of builds this thing called uh, a bee tree. I tried to, uh, to draw a three out of bees here. Um, so, if you don't know what a bee tree is, uh, it's actually the foundation for many databases. Um, if you ever use something like CouchDB, uh, that's very bee tree heavy. Um, they're very cool because they, they they do this one thing that, that basically does so you can build any kind of crazy index on top. They have this thing called sorted iteration, which means that they're a thing that's, you know, it's data structure that's, that's first of all, really well understood. It's been around for many, many, many years. I think it's in the, probably since the 70s or 60s. Um, it, like I said, it has this uh, feature of sorted iteration, which means that it's, it's, it's really good at telling you, you know, between two ranges, give out everything that is in that database in a, in a, in a sort of way where you can define the sorting. Um, you define it up front. Uh, but that's actually how you, you know, with those properties, you can, you can basically build any kind of, you know, SQL engine or anything like that. Uh, obviously, with a lot of engineering on top, but that's like the foundation you need. So they're very foundational. Um, if you're like me and uh, you went to school and started computer science, uh, or um, have an engineering background. You probably learned about bee trees in school. I definitely didn't. I didn't pay any attention, uh, and that, that, was, that was a mistake. So if you're, if you're in school, pay attention to the data structure classes because it's actually really interesting and it's the kind of thing that's uh, surprisingly hard to learn afterwards because it's, it's much easier if you have somebody there to help, you know, guide you through uh, data structures and what what they are. So that's just my little, you know, I'm old now, so I can give these disclaimers now. Um, I'm a little bit nervous now because Nicola is in the panel here, and, and uh, he's, you know, he's like a thousand times smarter than me about this stuff. So I'm like, probably going to explain all this wrong, but I tried to do like a little, you know, short explain about what a feature is. So it's, it's basically something like this: this data structure, 
we have, you know, these trees, you know, you can see this is kind of like a tree because it has levels and, you know, the arrows here are like uh, partners to, to, to children. Uh, so this is a this is a simple B tree that has like two keys per per per, per node and and three uh, child child partners uh, per node also. Uh, so in this B tree here, you can see it, you know this this has data from uh, zero to uh, seven. Yeah, without the six, I just realized now, but it doesn't matter. Um, um, and um, <clears throat> this is kind of how you structure. So the way you read this is that. You have this two in the top, um, and the arrow, you know, that point that's to the left of the two that the points to a bucket. That's like here is everything lower than two in the B tree, and the, the pointer in the middle between two and five down to three and four. That's like everything between three and four is in this bucket, and the pointer to the right is like everything bigger than seven is in that bucket. So you know, you can kind of imagine in your head that if you start at the root, it's kind of easy to find something because you just do this bisecting thing where you like, you know. By, by in the bucket where what am I looking for? Where is in between? Is it lower than this? And then you follow the correct pointer down. So it's pretty, pretty actually that is pretty straightforward. Um, it's a really good Wikipedia article about just those aspects. Uh, you know, like with any data structure, it's, it's, it's like interesting how you insert data and get data out. So in a B tree, like let's say we wanted to insert actually the missing six in this one here, you would just do a traversal down, find the, the you know the leaf node that you be in. And you just insert it. You can see here conveniently there is there was space in this bucket. There was one free space, so you just insert it. So super simple to do to those things, but it gets much more complicated in a second because in a B tree, you can do stuff like you know you can overflow the bucket. So here, if you wanted to insert an eight afterwards, also, and now all of a sudden there is uh, too many nodes in this thing based on how we define this with, with uh, only two uh, values per, per node. So now there's three nodes in it, but we can't have that. So B tree does this. Uh, B trees do this thing uh, bucket splitting, where you basically say, "Oh, when it's full, you you take the the, the the median value and you move that up, and then you split the the bucket you went into two different ones." So you can see here that bucket down the on the road down the right kind of splits into two, and we move this the seven up because I was in the middle, and we make two new children. Um, and it's recursive because now we have the same problem up in the in the parent. Where <coughs> there's still three, too many nodes in the parent, so we keep doing this. We make a node on top, and then we move the medium up. So you know, you kind of notice how the tree always grows at the top. So that's just like that's basically you know how B tree works. It's actually not that hard. It's very surprisingly hard in practice to implement these things because it's just like <laughs> it's like a lot of like if sentences and like these things because the um, way um, these algorithms work. But, um, and also, you know, obviously stuff like deleting from it is, is, is also complicated and stuff like that. Uh, but that's the basic idea. Uh, so really, you know, if you don't know about the things, it's actually, you know, it's like a running joke that we don't need to know about these things uh, because we always get asked about this to do them in interviews. And, uh, but it's actually, you know, you can, you can, they're very useful. So uh, I would encourage people to dig in if you don't know anything, I'm just giving you a track of time. So, uh, what Hyper-B is, it's a log-based speed tree. So basically the idea is we want to take a speed tree because it has all these nice uh, capabilities. We want to make it work in a way where we can put it into an append-only log because append-only logs are really good for peer-to-peer -peer systems. So they're very easy to distribute and they're very fast to loop up in and uh, uh, they're just really nice. Um, so the way we do it in Hyper-B is we actually, it's quite simple. We just build a B tree uh, like we would normally and then every time we insert something, we consider that a mutation. And any um, <coughs> parent node to that mutation is an indirect mutation because you know if you mutate it down here on the right, then uh, that node, you're basically also mutating the pointer to that node because it has to point to a new thing. Uh, so we just build a B tree. We track all the mutations. We track all the indirect mutations whenever we we um, we do something with it, and then. Uh, we just take all those mutated nodes and we store in a, in a, in a log, so in a single log entry. So a, a log entry here just being like the latest entry to an append only log. So this is actually, it can be quite expensive because, you know, obviously if you have a tree, you're going to have um, log n uh, parents, you know, logarithmic 
parents. Uh, so every update is going to have logarithmic mutations, um, at least that's basically at the minimum. So um, luckily for us, since we're storing anything in an append-only log, that means that every you know any entry we store can basically be be addressed by this simple tuple of uh, uh, sequence number, which is just a number that corresponds to where in, in the log was where is this mutated node stored. And then a relative offset of like which number of mutation is this. Um, and both of these are actually just numbers because you know a, a pointer into a log, a sequence number is just the same as a pointer into an array. So that's just a you know a growing number that. Uh, uh, Normally, can be expressed by a UN64, like a bit, a bit by number, and it can be compressed with a, something like a var or something like that. And uh, as for the number of mutations, like I said, you're going to have, uh, you know, at, at max, some factor of um, uh, how many parents you have. So it's like logarithmic times some, some small factor. <laughs> In practice, it means like it's, it's less than 256 because two, 2 to the power of 256 is, is a really massive big tree. So. Uh, just one byte for those. So actually, three really compressible uh, addresses for a node. And then what we do is we just say, well, then a node is just you know a node has like I said, it has a bunch of keys. Uh, a keys are also just stored in the log entry you put in. So that's what you count the sequence numbers. And then it has a series of pointers to the children of the B tree. And that's just those tuples. So it's actually very very small because uh, all of those is just a bunch of numbers. I mean, everything is just a bunch of numbers when it comes down to it, but this is actually this, just a bunch of small numbers. So it actually compresses really, really nicely because we can do stuff like delta encode those numbers uh, and a lot of those numbers, numbers, like I said, are actually very small. Um, so um, that's basically what Hyper-B is. It's just a way to build a B tree, uh, track the mutations, compress them down so you can fit them in a log entry, uh, and then have it all be working in an append-only immutable fashion. Uh, or P2P network. Um, right, so when you do a B tree, you gotta do a lot of uh, lookups, a lot of round trips, because basically, if we go down to my rule tree here before, like I said, if you're looking for something like six here, you first have to look at the root, that means you have to, you know, get in the log, find the root, uh, find the keys out. So there's a lot of network round trips. So if you can pretty slowly in practice. Um, so what we do is we have this. Uh, pretty uh, uh, cool cache hitting system built into our network where we can actually untrusted uh, hit any result to a query, which in practice uh, results in a, a max two round trips for any kind of yoga, which is really cool, uh, which basically means it's pretty fast and compressed. Uh, and that's a whole talk by itself how that thing works, but uh, I didn't want to spend too much time on it. So, you know, that's a lot of techno babble. I thought it would be easier to understand if I'm just showing a little demo. So, <clears throat> I wrote this little script here today. So, this is actually uh, using a data set of uh, all IMDb data. IMDb, if you don't know, actually, you know, the, the movie database has public free data sets that you can use for non commercial use. So I took all the IMDb data and I indexed into a Hyper-B database where I put all the, the, the entries on an IMDb under these keys where I say it's an ID and then it uh, has an IMDb ID. And this is running uh, out in the, in the network form. Uh, this is data that is identified by this, this append only log here. Uh, so what we do here is we, know we make the log, we make a Hyper-B instance. I just stored as JSON right now. We connect to the network. Then I do a, a couple of loopups here for some shows and I time them to see how it works. So let's just try to run this and see, uh, see if it actually still works. You can see here, should, hopefully we'll get two shows out. Uh, and then uh, it, it uh, also tells how many entries are in the database. So we have an idea like, if it's cool or not. So try to run. Matthias, can you make your font size a little bit bigger? Yeah. Cool. So as you can see, I ran it. Uh, it took a couple of seconds um, to find uh, Rick and Morty, and then took, uh, which is a title, and uh, took a, a little bit slower, a little bit faster, sorry, to find uh, the Simpsons, which was the entry. 
Uh, the reason why it's a little bit uh, faster for the other entry is that we're timing here is also like setting up a network, connecting to people, hole punching, getting the data out and stuff like that. And um, the cool thing is it's a peer-to-peer -peer database. So after we ran it, we actually have the data here stored locally in this DB folder. Uh, so which means that if we run it again, it should be <coughs> quite a bit faster. So you can see here, second time we ran it, it's, it's a lot faster because the only thing it needs to do on the second one is to make sure that the data we have is actually up to date. Uh, but when it actually does the B2 resolving, it has all the data already. So it's uh, it's uh, it's going to be pretty uh, efficient. Um, so this kind of lookups you can also do with some other data structure. Uh, in the past, I've done a lot of talks about uh, hash tries and stuff like that. It's just key value lookups. So the, actually, the B tree doesn't really help us much there. What the B tree does, which makes this much more interesting, is it, it gives us the sorted iteration. Oh, and by the way, you can see here this, in, this database has uh, roughly 8 million entries, which gives you an idea of like uh, the scale, which is I mean, OK. Um, so for the sorted iteration, to kind of showcase that, I took also all the IMDb ratings data, because that's actually kind of interesting, and made an index of um, you know uh, all tiles in my IMDb rated by their, uh, sorted by their rating. And I have that stored in this script here. So it's the same script, except that uh, what we do here instead is we make a read stream in this rating subset. So we say, if you ever done LabelDB, the syntax is kind of similar to this in HyperDB. We get all the ratings out, and then we, we do a reverse sorting of that over the P2P network. And then we say we just want to get the, the 20 top sorted shows. So if I run this, <clears throat> it spits out here the 20 shows and also prints out the timing between them. So you're actually pretty fast to get them once you get the first one because that's that cache hinting lookup I was talking about. Um, so it's a little bit hard to read these, obviously, because this is just title entries. I don't know if anybody can do these title entries lookups in their head. So I made this, uh, you can see this in the code. I made this little uh, function here where you can, we can give it map, and it just does a transform stream that just maps these to the actual entries. Um, so let's try to run that. So I'm going to be a little bit slower, because we need to do like a, a basically like a, a a join. Um, <clears throat> and not just so a I join, but a network. What's that? A network join. It's a network join as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I, I do all these in parallel. So actually, you know, it's, yeah, it's actually pretty fast. It's like, uh, you know, less than a millisecond between these. Um, and the first one, obviously, is a little bit slower because I have to do a lot of work there. Uh, so you can see here that, you know, in my very naive indexing, because I don't, you know, IMDb also has like, um, how many votes does the show have and stuff like that in their, in their data set. I just did, you know, straight up the rating. Uh, you can see here the, that the most rated show on IMDb is, uh, is this one, Battle of the Bastards, which I think is probably a uh, Game of Thrones thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. So not surprising. Makes sense. Uh, and uh, just to show like nothing off my teeth, and this is actually, uh, I got a little bit offended by this, so you can see in a second. But if I do the, the opposite thing, I'd look up the unreverse, then we get the 20 lowest rated things out on IMDb. <laughs> um, oh my god, I forgot to map it. <clears throat> the 20 lowest ones are, um, it's actually Danish shows, and I'm from Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> the number one worth rated show is uh, the Crown Prince and his her, his wife live from the castle. So that's kind of wow. go to jail for that for some sort of like monarchy offense. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty fun. So again, it's like you can see here, like. Um, you know, it's 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 peer to peer. So every time, you know, if I run it again, you know, uh, it'll be faster because uh, we have most of the data cached already. So it's kind of like you know, and it's always guaranteed to get the latest things if if there's a new thing in. That's what the network guarantees. Uh, I mean, no, like crazy, too crazy nest splits. Um, so all in all, uh, pretty fast. 
<laughs> yeah. So, so uh, Matthias, um, we're getting some questions from the live chat and um, yeah. wondering if you wanted to answer some of them. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, cool. So we, we can all, like everyone on the panel also here, we have with us, um, uh, you know, Andrew, who's speaking next. We have Paul Frazee, who works on, on Beaker browser, which uses Hypercore. And then we, we have Mikola from who spoke last week at the last event. And we're all just here to sort of uh, ask questions and, and hang out. So uh, one question I'm seeing in the in the chat is um, like someone's struggling to put in context like Hi Hyper-B, you know, they're trying to figure out what, what just happened. So they looked up Hyper-B and they're like, okay, so we have an IMDB somewhere on a, on a Hypercore, right? Mm -hmm. um, and somehow some, some of the parts of it just got downloaded. Um, right. But like, yeah. what is exactly going on? They're like, there's a peer-to-peer -peer pen only log and then we just demoed like downloading part of it or, or what, you know, What's, yeah, the, so, what's the context? So there is a. <clears throat> I can go a little bit slower over that part. So there is a there's a peer-to-peer pen only log that has this B tree index um, that's live indexing. So every time IMDb updates, it gets a new entry in uh, that has, uh, like I said, roughly eight million entries in the log. So it's a pretty big, big log. Uh, what happens when I do these queries is that the, we inflate the B tree, but by only looking at the last part of the the log and then working our way backwards. So we're downloading very little data, we can resolve like these queries that's like uh, you know uh, not log numbers but like uh, a name of a sorry a title of a show uh, to a show, uh, and also doing those ratings queries again we can do them very efficiently because we don't have to download the entire log to do them uh, just like a little bit of data to to, to find what we're looking for. Um, so it's a peer-to-peer -peer data structure. It's all putting in a, in a log, uh, but it's indexed in a way where it's all embedded. So we can just look up exactly what we're looking for with very, very low latency, uh, or like at least for like a P2P network. Yeah. Um, if I can uh, jump in, I'm sorry, uh, uh, can I? Yeah. Um, I'm getting sorry. some feedback on the microphone here, so I'm going to just unplug my earphones for a second. But uh, can you elaborate a bit about how you do the two round trip thing? I know you uh, said mm -hmm. it was like a whole other talk, but can you just give like a quick hint about how that part works? Yeah, sure. So basically, the way the tree uh, the B tree resolution works by itself is is uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's like you just look at the last one, you, you inflate those that you know compress index, and you do the the round trips. That all works, and that's like completely um, um, the only thing you trust there is the original writer um, that they index it correctly, so you can get the data from anyone. Um, but that's like I said, it's a bit, it, it can be a bit slow because it's like it's, it's logarithmic and logarithmic in peer to peer systems usually means uh, like tens of seconds uh, because a, a lot of round trips depending on where where the person you are talking to. So, what we do, uh, Nicola, for the uh, well, like I said, for the caching is that we actually send out into the network what you're looking for, like in terms of a query. And then our peers can choose to resolve that query for you and then hint back which sequence numbers in the log the query resolves to. So what you can do then on the on the on the as the person trying to look up a thing in the database or doing a stream in the database is you get this results back. It's just like somebody tells you you don't trust these people. They tell you like these uh, this query probably results in, in these uh, hundreds uh, blocks from the log having to be downloaded. So what we do is we we uh, uh, we download those blocks in the background, but we just keep doing our B tree traversal as we would otherwise. So if the peer hitting us the the, the cache is is uh, is not lying, uh, sorry, if it's lying, it doesn't matter because what happens is we still do our uh, untrusted lookup by looking at the last one. But if if the peer was not lying, then it just happens that we have everything in the cache while we're looking at it because we can download it all in parallel. If that makes sense. I see. So it's you just returned like the root to leaf path of all of the nodes that were involved. Yeah, in but since, since it's all only a pen only log entries, it's just okay. like a sequence number for each. It's very very yeah. small that, that thing, um, and uh, they can also choose to just send a partial path to it, and they can also choose to not to answer it at all, and then you just do the, mm -hmm. the traversal. Um, and we only do this. We only initiate this uh, caching hitting system when we know for a fact that we don't have the entire path ourselves. So it's like uh, the more and more data you get, the less and less you'll be in the path, which is pretty good for, for yeah. uh, privacy um, afterwards. So, 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 oh, go ahead. No, yeah, that's one. That's one. It's just a techno babble. <laughs> TLTR, techno babble. If you didn't follow it, that, that's what yeah. just happened. 
<laughs> I mean, I can I can ask more follow up questions, but maybe we can open it up a bit to the uh, audience. Yeah, let's do a couple more really quick, and then we got to move on to uh, uh, to the next yeah. talk. So Andrew Andrew can get his his uh, stuff in. So uh, one question question was, can this be treated as a distributed successor to Level? Yeah, exactly. So actually, Andrew did make a level down that runs on this. Uh, it is, you know, it has the same limitation as the hybrid course, a single writer system. Um, but yeah, it, it, you can run a full level to be on top. Uh, Andrew did this with a bunch of stuff and um, just resolves down to hyper B queries, but with all the sparse, sparse niceness so that you can have these massive databases without, and you can query them pretty fast without having to replicate the entire data set. That's awesome. That's so cool. Um, one other one was, does data keep accumulating from the mutations, or is there a way to drop the old obsolete nodes from the tree? Um, data does, it's on like canon log. So every time we, we add something, it does um, add to the log, obviously. But um, it auto compresses the B tree. So obviously, every time you do a, 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 a you know, if you, if, let's say you wrote the same thing a thousand times, if you then did a lookup, you would just skip over the ninety nine 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 uh, one of one of them because uh, um, you uh, there nothing is pointing to them. So it kind of auto compresses that way. Um, so the, the log can auto compress also that way. We don't do anything fancy with uh, like cleaning out the old data, but we could uh, because um, through, through that system we know when data is being unlinked. So yes, it, you know. So the only thing you're like. Uh, the only data you're making is like you're obviously using a new sequence number this time. So your sequence number only gets up, but you don't have to use the entire log. So it's it's all completely. Makes sense. Okay. Cool. Anyone anyone else have qu uh, final questions? Uh, Matthias, okay. could you like describe the, how the stack operates? So you have the the layers of abstraction between the hypercore level and how the hyper B relates to that. Uh, yeah, I can try in one minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we have our core foundational tech, which is the hypercore up here, which is like the append only log. That's the thing that does all the heavy lifting with like getting data on the network. Uh, we have a you know website for that, the hypercore protocol website, uh, hypercore.protocol.org. Um, so that's about all the heavy lifting. Like the only thing that gives you is like a log that has where you can address things by sequence numbers. So you can say add something to it, and then it tells you, well, it's under sequence number five, and then you add something again, it's like sequence number six, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can get data out. But the cool thing is that you can get previous data out in a secure fashion without having to download the entire log. Um, so that's the foundational part. And then Hyper-B is kind of like, it's a, it's, a, it's a view on top in a way, where it kind of instead of you addressing things by sequence numbers, you can address things by uh, string keys and ranges, right? And the range here being like everything between the string key and this string key in a sort of fashion. That's the two-minute TLDR. So it's hypercore here, hyper B on top of it. Yeah. And hypercores are like your block storage, and the hyper yeah. hyper B is like your file abstraction, but in this case, a data key value abstraction. Yeah. Exactly. Cool. All uh, right. Let's do one more one more final question that I'm seeing here in the chat. Is uh, it's um, someone someone's asking if they. Um, if it's sparsely replicated or it's always the whole caboodle. Um, another variant of the question was, if, if you run a query, do you end up with the full B tree index locally? Um, and then, you know, do you need to, basically, do you need the full B tree index before you can do any lookups? It's all sparsely replicated, which means that you're only getting uh, um, the data you're, um, you bet, you're only getting the data you're, you're, like if you search for a key, you're only getting the result of the key in the past to that key, which is like log n entries. Um, so very little data per, per query, and um, you do not get you know you do not get the full feature index locally when you do a query. That query is also running sparsely, um, so you only get like you know let's say in my IMDb data here I have the ratings and the index for the ratings is it's the entire database because everything has a rating. Hmm. Uh, yeah. When I don't, when I only get the, the the best the highest twenty, I only get those twenty and then a path to that which is very very small. Hmm. Got it. Uh. It's too bad we don't have more time for questions. I have one more thing I'd want to ask. Though. Go for it. Go just go for it. Well, so uh, what is the authentication uh, like sort of strategy for this? Like, do you consider things like adversarial insertion patterns where you could make mm -hmm. a really unbalanced B tree? And do you authenticate the index construction 
or is that done when you append to it, right? So it's like, is it like the log itself that's the authenticated data structure, or is it like the the log when you append to it is you're updating like the root node of the B tree and the hash from that, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, we do. I mean, we put a lot of trust in the original writer, which is the person identified okay. in that interview that is key. So right now we expect them to build the feature correctly. Um, but we do also run some, um, having said that, when you do query the feature, you get the feature out. It's not naive in the way that if somebody mm -hmm. put a million things in the same bucket, it would just follow that. It, like, it would fail them and uh, say it's, it's unusable. Um, I see. So. So you couldn't have like a B tree index be constructed by an untrusted uh, source. It has to be a trusted. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right now it has to be a, a, a trusted source, like similar to how the person writing the the hypercore uh, also right. has to be trusted in a way. Like, yeah. That's why but you. Yeah. But you couldn't have like a log that already existed from some like data source that was trusted and then have an untrusted computer build an index from that. You, the computer that builds it is also trusted in the loop. So the uh, index I mean, is. I have some uh, we have some ideas for that. We actually did some experiments with that. Where, but like at, at the end of the day, the trust has to come back to some oracle. I've seen okay. that. Like, that like, yeah. Kind of like. Okay. Well, I, I think that's good. <laughs> All right. Listen, I'm st I'm abusing up too much time. Let's. Uh, I'm sorry about that. I want. <laughs> I have more. I want to ask, but I don't want to. I don't want to go. I don't want to be rude. I'm sorry. We can take it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we should just have a section at the end where we chat for a bit, honestly. Like, uh, and yeah. just ask, ask whatever stuff we didn't have time for. Um, but yeah, let's do some of it too. In, in mine, so, also. So I'm talking I, about I, I'm fine. Now, I'll give the floor. It's, uh, you can try it out. Yeah. It's on uh, uh, NPM. NPM install Hyper-B is it's super alpha. We fix bugs every day, but it, uh, it also kind of works. So it's fun. It's at the fun stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. All right. Let's move on to, uh, to Andrew's talk. Um, so uh, and Andrew's going to uh, share with us uh, information about how you now can you can take what Matthias just explained uh, Hyper-B and you can use it to um, index peer-to-peer -peer sites. So uh, go ahead and take it away, Andrew. Very excited to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrew. My, my handle online is Andrew Roche on Twitter and GitHub. And uh, I've gone hypercore protocol stuff with Matthias out here in, uh, in Copenhagen. And I also work uh, remotely with, uh, with Paul on, on stuff in Beaker. And so, you know, what I'm working on really depends on, on the week you ask, but it generally it splits between those two things. And so lately um, we've been working on building a, a big indexer for peer-to-peer -peer sites uh, in Beaker. And I'm gonna kind of lead up to that with this talk. Um, but before that, I kind of also wanna talk about what really interests me about Hyper-B and what I'm excited by. And I also want to kind of lead up to, I want to talk about how Beaker uh, is built and operates and just to kind of set the context for that. Um, so let's go to the next slide. You might, you might even um, want to give like a little pitch for what Beaker even is in case people don't, don't even. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to start, I'm going to start at the beginning. There's going to be a little overview slide where I just kind of talk about just the general design, but I also encourage you it's, it's, it kind of assumes a little familiarity with Beaker. So if you don't know anything about it, I definitely encourage you to check out beakerbrowser.com and, and look at the docs there just to, to get an overview. Um, but I will, I will do a little bit. Um, so first just to talk about what I'm interested in with, uh, with Hyper-B. Um, the, the space of data structures that are built on Hypercore, which is this peer-to-peer -peer replicating append-only log that we have, um, I think can generally be split into two buckets. You have these materialized view uh, types of data structures like, uh, like Capacore, which you can check out on, on GitHub, which basically scans over the entire append-only log in order and then generates a secondary index out of that, which you can then query like, like a database. Um, and this is, this is fine, but it, it, one downside to this is that it requires um, a full sync Generally, I think there's some work to, uh, to to make this sparse as well, but I think typically it requires a full sync. Um, might want to check out the, the docs for for the state of that the new sparse Kappa stuff. But um, that's a general property of doing you know, Kappa style indexing of append only logs is you have to do this full scan and download the entire thing. Um, the second approach is by embedding the index directly inside of the hypercore itself, um, and this is what's used in in Hypertry, which powers um, Hyperdrive. Uh, lots of hypers. But Hyperdrive is the, our distributed file system that's kind of a, a big part of the Hypercore protocol world. Um, and the way file system metadata is indexed inside of there is stored in this tri structure, which is kind of like a tree, but it stores prefixes of file paths. Um, and these, are, these have this really interesting property where they can be sparsely synced, which Matthias talked about a little bit. 
Um, and what that means is, is that when you do a query on this data structure, you're only going to pull in the portions of this append only log that you need to satisfy it. So in, in, in uh, Hypertry's case, it's going to be portions of the try that lead to that uh, Kiggy pair. Uh, and in Hyper-V, it means portions of the uh, B tree that lead to the value you're interested in. So that's what sparsely syncing means. I'm going to say that a lot throughout this talk, but I think it's a very important property of all of this stuff. Um, so why do I like Hyper-V? Um, it's, you know, a, a B tree built on Hyper-V core is really something I've wanted for a super long time. And so I'm, it's really exciting that Matthias uh, uh, cracked it. And it's still alpha, but it, it does seem to be working pretty, pretty nicely. Um, I, I'm really excited about it because it, I think it opens the door to databases. Um, you know, whereas Hyperdrive is really good for file system indexing, the, uh, the iteration over directories is all unsorted. So it's, it's not super ideal for, for doing range queries, which I think is what you really need to build these databases. And, and you can see this because it's, it's pretty small to, to build a level down adapter on top of Hyper-V. Is it compatible with this really big ecosystem of uh, modules built on top of in the level world? Uh, like PouchDB and level graph, all sorts of different kinds of databases. And one can imagine you know, a future where you can run SQL queries over these kinds of databases built on hyper data structures or with some modifications to the B tree, but maybe using the same trick, you can make spatial indexes and full text search indexes and all these different kinds of things um, to power search engines and, and the like. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about this. Um, and especially when you combine all the above with sparse syncing, because I really think that's that's killer. It means if you have, say, a giant uh, database with lots of map tiles or map metadata in it, and you're only interested in what's going on in one small location, you can reach out to the peer-to-peer -peer network and only pull in those portions of the index that you really need. And <clears throat> especially with this hinting extension, uh, it can actually be pretty quick. Uh, so that's why I really like Hyper-V. Um, I want to step back and just kind of talk about uh, Beaker a little bit. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, and, and you can see here on the slide, it kind of assumes a little bit of prior knowledge about Beaker. But Beaker is a, a, a modified web browser that works with hyperdrives currently. So hyperdrives are these these peer-to-peer -peer file systems, and um, and Beaker lets you display websites that are stored inside of these hyperdrives. Um, and so the, the general way it works is when you sign up for Beaker, you're given this profile drive, which is kind of your public presence in the Beaker network. And uh, your profile drive is basically like a personal site, but you can also store, um, you know, other kinds of content in it as well, like you know, comments and files that you might want to share. And I'm going to talk about that a lot. Um, as far as socializing and sharing goes, um, I say everybody has this profile drive. These profile drives are identified by Hypercore keys, and so and you can add people to an address book. And this is the the, the follow mechanism that currently exists in in Beaker right now. Um, it works, it works nicely. Um, the, I think one big problem with it is that um, it's only accessible through APIs currently, meaning you, know, you, you have to develop an application in user land to make use of the address book uh, and the, the social system. And uh, the other is that it's all private. So this is, all, this is not information that's accessible to other users in Beaker. Yeah, rather, your uh, social network is not accessible to other users. It's all private to you. Um, so, so that's the social system, and that's you know the, what the profile drive in Beaker is. And then, how do you build applications? Because Beaker is also this applications platform for working with this you know sea of hyperdrives. So, apps are really just views over profile drives or views over hyperdrives. So, the way they work, and I'm just going to jump right to that. The way they work is you know Beaker APIs to applications, and so right here you can kind of see in this little code snippet, there's this Beaker.hyperdrive.query API. And you give it this path specification, this, this regex, and it will scan over the various uh, file systems, the various followers that you have in your address book, and pull out files that match the, the spec. And it, and, you, and it turns out this is a really powerful system. You can build things like a Twitter clone or you know, various microblogging apps uh, just by reading from all these different uh, drives that your followers or the, the people you're following have. Um, so this is the, the general way that, that app development happens. Um, but it has some downsides. Uh, I, I think it, it works really nicely uh, in, in general, but there are a couple of things that we, you know, we've noticed as part of the 1.0 beta, which has been out for a handful of months right now, that we've seen you know, people stumbling on. And, and so one, one part of this is the, is the way data is represented inside of Beaker. So microblogging posts, for example, um, you, you would store those as markdown files in your profile drive, but those have to be interpreted by some application in user land. So right now we have this default application, which uh, is called Blobity Blog, uh, which stores markdown files and then can read them out. Kind of looks a little bit like Twitter. Um, but Beaker has no semantic understanding of the kinds of content types that are being generated by applications. Uh, and there's a real missed opportunity there. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. 
Um, the other is uh, the other three ones here kind of relate to the general problem of, of connecting with people and discovering content in the network. Um, right now we have this empty profile problem where you, you get dropped into Beaker and you create your profile drive and then you don't really know what to do from there. And so we, we wind up with people having these, these websites, these personal sites that just don't have too much content in, in them after initial creation. Uh, and, so, and, and, and so it looks like there's very little activity because it's not surfaced to the user in that way. Um, and the others, and the other two are are basically related to uh, to content discovery. It's because the the social networks are are kind of are, are gated through private APIs or APIs that are only accessible to um, to the user. Uh, other users can't look at my profile and see who I might be connected to. And so you know it, it's kind of challenging to do things like you know looking at friends of friends and exploring broader parts of the network in order to pull in content and make the, the ecosystem feel lively. So those are the kind of the main things that that um that we've identified in the beta so far. Um, so so now I want to talk a little bit about what's next, and I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over in a second and just give a little preview of a very small parts of what's coming next. But um kind of looking at those weaknesses, we we decided to do a handful of things. One is to you know really embrace the fact that apps are storing users are storing semantically meaningful content inside of profile drives. So the, the profile drive is starting to become less of a file system that stores these untyped markdown and HTML files. And it's starting to become more of a database that stores things like you know, blog posts and, and comments and micro blog posts and all these various other meaningful content types are being, are being stored and not surfaced to the user by anything built into the Beaker UIs. So we've decided to you know, really embrace the fact that we're building a personal database. And alongside of that, um, we're trying to use that personal database to build out a personal search system. Uh, so you know, what, what this means is you know, we're, we're, we're by, by taking advantage of that, we can really make it possible to you know, create and discover these kind of semantically meaningful types and actually have built-in support into Beaker for, for doing that easily. And there's a little bit of semantic webbiness to this, but it's also super simple. You know, a, a file's type is really identified by a little bit of metadata on the file object. And it's just a string, so you know it's 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 kind of a simple approach to some of the good parts of the semantic web ecosystem without um, without any 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 um, any clumsiness around it. And a big part of this it involves kind of surfacing this linked data component to the to the user. So you know we're we're going to be aggregating and accumulating this information and uh, surfacing it, and that really requires building out this this search system that users can use to to query everything that's going to be happening inside of their profile database. Um, and so, you know, to kind of boil us down, you know, we're, we're starting to think about Beaker as this, this information management system and really trying to invest in tooling to, to make it useful to search over the things that, that you've accumulated, both personally, you know, and uh, as part of the network that you're a part of. And I give just of what, uh, of what the data layer, layer actually can kind of, you know, what the problem was in the past that I, I think um, we've come up with a pretty clever solution for it. Um, so let's see. So I'm going to switch over to uh, to my profile site. I'm I'm giving this presentation in Beaker. By the way, uh, and, um, but it's my it's my choice. It's not because I'm a I'm a terrible web designer. Uh, so this is my profile, uh, and uh, see here I'm I'm displaying some uh, micro blog posts. Like I said before, these are just read from the file system in my profile drive, and I'm rendering them here. Um, and this is interesting because, you know, as a publisher, I get to kind of control how my personal information is presented. But as a reader, you, you know, they might not be able to get what they want out of this system very easily. Um, and so what we've added by virtue of the fact that we're trying to turn this profile hyperdrive into something that resembles more of a database are a handful of uh, tool uh, tools on the left here that let you kind of see this data layer of, of Beaker. So I can click on the site profile view um, and it's going to load uh, that I've created, and you know, comments on stuff that have happened to the network, uh, little posts I've made, um, pages that I've created, that they would show up here. Um, similarly, I can look at comments and see, you know, who has said things about my page in the Beaker network, people that I'm I'm subscribed to. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how to extend this. With so this is just like a little preview of you know the the features that we're adding to Beaker that kind of resurface this dual layer element of the browser where we have this structured data part and then we also have these HTML sites that render the data. Um, yeah. So let me switch back to the, the slides. Cool. Let me get rid of this. All right. 
So where does Hyper-V fit in? Uh, so I think there are two places where you can imagine Hyper-V coming into the equation here. One is because we're treating the profile drive like more of a database, uh, we can really imagine it as like a database file system, a file system that's augmented with a Hyper-V on the side. Uh, and what this, mean, what this means is that that query function that I showed before that powers like the microblogging application, we can make that a lot faster because right now the way that works is that has to read a great many files in the file system in order to do things like sort them by time or index them the way it, it should be indexed for that. Um, and so we can make that uh, a lot faster and more network efficient. And also the, this, the shareable secondary indexing part, I think is also super, super interesting. It means that you know, if I've indexed a portion of the Beaker network and organized it in some way, I should be able to advertise the fact that I've created that index to other people. And then those people can then take advantage of the fact that I already did that work to generate the secondary index from the hyperdrives and just load from that. Um, the other is more targeted towards addressing that content discovery problem that we had before, where, uh, and then the feedback problem, uh, where we can generate this one giant Hyper-V out of all the drives that are existing in the Beaker network. And right now, when you sign up for Beaker, you can optionally register your, your profile drive key in the Beaker user list, and uh, we can find that drive and start observing it for changes and start adding it to this giant ordered index that if I've downloaded a portion of that index through a search, I can then share that portion again on the network. Uh, and we can do a lot of things with this, like gathering backlinks and doing a ranking to, to uh, over users or content that's, that's more personalized for each person. So now I just want to do, do a couple of cartoons before the demo. I'm kind of running out of time to do them very, very quickly. Uh, but how, how do we do this? Uh, basically, we, we want to take the, all, all of the different components, all the different modules in the Hypercore ecosystem and put them in the cloud and make them scale to be able to persistently observe a very large number of users, users in the network. And so uh, because I've worked with Kubernetes in the past, you know, every, I have a hammer, so everything becomes a nail. So we basically can, you know, containerized the bulk of the different modules in the system and are able to, you know, we push them up to the cloud like this. Uh, and, in, and in a horizontally scalable way. So you can see these swarm components here. Um, these can be, be, you know, these connect to a subset of the users in the Beaker, Beaker ecosystem. And we can tune that depending on how much traffic the different uh, drives each swarm is responsible for are connecting to. Um, and then alongside of these, these swarms, we have this, uh, this indexer node uh, that's running that uh, is basically is watching all these uh, green smiley faces, uh, all their drives for, for changes, and then dumping them into this, this Hyper-V index. Um, and Matias said this looks like an, an octopus, and he so kindly drew me an octopus, and, and I, think I, I think I agree with him. It's like it's the, the octopus design of an indexer. Um, so, so, you know, you can imagine right here, for example, these two faces on the left are both kind of mutually connected to one another in the Beaker network. They're subscribed. And the two on the right are also connected. Uh, these two groups are not really going to, they don't intersect. So you're not going to see content between the two of them. But by taking advantage of this XR, you can pull in global changes from the network and then merge the results you get from that global index with your local view of the network to you know, see a more active representation of what's going on in, in, the, in the Beakerverse. Um, all right, I'm a little tiny bit over, but I do have a tiny demo. Uh, do, I, do I have a uh, time for that for us? Yeah, go for it. All right, cool. Um, so I'm going to jump back over to uh, to the uh, to where I was in the past. I'm going to go back to the comment pane, but on a different page. So I'm going to jump over to this uh, the Speakeasy JS page here um, and uh, open up the comment tab, which is an, another one of these trusted interfaces that Beaker provides for creating structured data in your personal database. And I can I can create a comment. Um, and for the purposes of this demo. Paul is is not uh, subscribed to me, uh, so you know, in normal in the normal Beaker world, he would not be able to see any any content coming from me. Um, so I'm going to make a comment. I'm talking here with um, you're like this comment system can take advantage of running queries on this personal database to kind of do things like auto completion and all these different views, um, and then I can uh, I can publish it. Um, and what's going to happen now is because this indexer in the cloud is watching my drive, uh, it's going to see that there's been an update, and it's going to pull in that change, dump it into the indexer, and then Paul uh, should hopefully, hopefully see on his screen uh, an update. Should I show Paul's screen right now so people can see what he sees? Is Paul sharing his screen? Uh, that, yeah. Yeah. That would be, yeah. That'd be nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, so yeah, this is. Uh, yeah, here I'll just I'll show everything. Uh, okay, hold on. This is gonna be. Let me <laughs> let me get rid of the people that I don't need for this demo right now. Sorry, guys. Okay, so so uh, so we have Andrew's screen right. on the bottom, right next to Andrew, and then we Great. see Paul's screen up there on the top yeah. next to him. So drum roll, please. Oh man, live demos. Uh, well, you know, my network is actually is really, really choppy. Can you can you just refresh it? Yeah, I'll try. I was one hundred percent confident that, that was probably going to work. Why don't I write a little query while we're waiting here? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Oh, the demo gods. Yeah, it's not coming down. Yeah, but you know, in, in my my network, my computer's just been all messed up because of uh, this this conference stuff. Uh, it's well, all good. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. All right. Um, that's my demo. I hope you enjoyed it. But yeah, I think um, I think it's really cool <laughs> what Hyper-V is. And I think there are a great many use cases for it. Uh, and rest assured, you know, when this is when this is live and running, I think it'll really bring a lot of a lot more activity to normal beaker use because you'll be able to see a much broader view of the network, and uh, I think it'll be. Really cool. So yeah, I think uh, that's all. That's all I got. Dude, I, 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 it's a, it's, a, it's a bummer that the demo didn't work, but um, it's super cool to see you guys building that trusted interface that comes out of the left, unless you do those kinds of actions at like a meta layer on top of random websites that aren't even built in Beaker. Like mm -hmm. the, or you know, that this the speakeasyjs.com site is literally a normal website it has no data inside of, uh, you know, hyperdrive. It's not like a, a site meant for. For Beaker, by the way, I should probably fix that and make it make a Beaker version of it. But, uh, but yeah, like that's that's pretty cool. So, um, does that just does that data just go into your personal um, uh, like uh, hyperdrive that you meant the one you mentioned your profile drive? That's where it goes. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It goes okay. into your profile drive, and then people that are subscribed to you can then see that change, uh, or it can be pulled in from the from the global index. But you know, the idea is you can kind of you can take these tools with you as you navigate around the web, and if you have a thought or an idea or a comment, you can you can use these uh, the sidebar tooling to to interact with your personal database and uh, mm -hmm. and add to it. Yeah. So you know, in the future, you can imagine extending this with things like uh, you know annotations on individual you know content objects in the page, something like like hypothesis. Um, or like a like quick, you know, if you if you have a if you have a thought and you want to open a little markdown editor, there is a markdown editor in Beaker already, but you know that could be that could be popped open. So I think there are plenty of ways to to extend that as well. So we have a an audience question here uh, from uh, Carolus uh, saying, "How come Paul would see the comment? How is how is the index involved there? Like, how, what it, role did it play? He didn't catch that part." Oh yeah, well, well, he didn't see the comment. I think there there were two beaker screens that were being shared, and one of them was mine, which is the comment that I posted. Um, and Paul's uh, had it been picked up by the indexer, uh, it would have uh, it would have displayed a related item in the network. Um, yeah, and so is that, in fact, I don't even see, I don't see the so I'm directly accessing his drive, and I don't see the most recent comment, which suggests to me, Andrew, that some reason yours is not swarming off of your device right now. So not only am I not getting it, but the indexer isn't getting it at the moment. Yeah, it's 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 not surprising. I've been I've been you know really trying to to you know patch all the leaks as my computer is stuttering and, and crumbling uh, because of all the stuff that's running on it. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that could be the result. Yeah, cool. Any uh, any other questions? Yeah, that that was a that was a, a, a cruel uh, cruel uh, fate from the demo gods. There, it's it's okay though. It's, yeah, no, uh, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, no, I thought I still thought it was cool, just even to see like the, the just the way that sidebar works looks super cool. Um, once it once it's working, um, or like once you fix your internet or whatever the problem was, it's going to be really cool. Um, any any questions yeah. from Nicole or Matthias or anybody see anything interesting in the chat that they want to ask? Hmm. Let's see. While, I, while we're waiting, I can show what I'm looking at right here is actually demonstrating that in action with, with data that did get synced. So I made this post right here, um, which is just a markdown file, um, which if I pop over here, you can see in the files listing, I believe it's going to be, yeah, this guy right here. So just one of my micro uh, in markdown files. And um, I got this comment section rendering uh, on the page, and you can see the extended network divider here. So above that, I'm going to zoom it in a little bit. So above this divider, these are people I'm subscribed to. Below that divider, it's people that I'm not subscribed to, and it's giving me those notifications there. So that's the stuff that's coming from the um, remote index. 
uh, the, the hyper B index. And um, like Andrew said, it's using um, a merger of two different indexes, the locally computed one, which is people haven't subscribed to as well as my own content, and then the remote one. And so if I ask the thing for just my local index. Paul, can you make your font bigger in your uh, console there? Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. So here I'm asking to list all the records in the index, which are linked to the current thing I'm looking at from my local index. And so that pulls out that uh, comment by Robbie there. And then if I expand that to include the network index as well, which is the what it's calling the Hyper-B index, it'll pull out all three there and merge those results all, result sets together. And it indicates which index it got it from, the local one or the network one. And so that's uh, that's how that merger works in, in the uh, APIs. That's super cool. Wow. Uh, so the indexer basically, it, it's just, it's, it's almost like if you're familiar with the, the secure scuttlebutt like uh, pubs, it's sort of doing a similar role. And it, it's like connect, connecting, uh, connecting people in the network by like downloading stuff that you would personally not be, be interested in downloading normally because you're not following those people and surfacing it. But it's, it's, it's not like a big deal if it's not downloaded. You know, if, 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 if the indexer doesn't really run, you'll just miss a few things here and there, but it's not like you're going to miss anything that you're, you're directly following because you're downloading all that stuff yourself, right? Is that right? Yeah, in a, in a practical sense, that's correct in terms of what it's accomplishing, helping you discover people that you're not directly connected to. But the SSB model actually has you replicating their content directly. So it's sort of like it, it sort of automatically makes you subscribe to people that are uh, multiple people out. Whereas ah, right. the Hyper-B index is producing a secondary index that's a totally different data set that you're looking at. Um, and um, so um, I suppose one of the key differences there is that the Hyper-B index, you're actually, uh, it's not trusted information anymore. You would have to go to source to, you know, authenticate it. Um, but, you know, that's the, that's because it's a secondary index. Super cool. Awesome. So is the, the plan for there to ultimately be many different indexers that are running and doing different uh, kind of like focused indexing tasks, or is it going to be just like one, you know, super indexer like Google or something in the future? It would definitely be cool to, to have many of them. I think there, there are different ways to, to, to go there, but I think the reason that it can be recreated or, or verified by anybody else. So, you know, you, can, you can download the index, uh, read it from, you know, it records inside it the last time it indexed a particular drive and, you know, the version of the code that's used to do the indexing. So anybody can can rebuild it and verify that, you know, say, say that we're indexing the drives correctly. Because uh, because one downside of this approach with building the secondary index is that is that the data is coming from a source that's not the original writer. Uh, hmm. So, you know, you kind of lose that. You have, you have to trust the indexer indexed correctly. And so it would be really nice to be able to have you know uh, a number of these indexers running side by side, so you can potentially verify results. Hmm. How expensive is it to verify one of these indexes? Uh, it would it would generally it would generally involve rebuilding the entire index if you wanted to to verify the whole thing. You could definitely okay. verify it per user as well, and that would work fine. Um, it, ideally, it, it would just involve rebuilding the whole index and then just comparing hmm. the. Um, the Merkle roots of the of the two different hypercores underneath that that are powering the hyperbees, um, but the way it's designed right now, you wouldn't be able to do quite that. Hmm. Cool. All right. Um, well, uh, any last questions before we go on to the social part of the event? Good. Good. Okay. Cool. Let's do it. So. Hey, dude, thanks a lot, Matthias and Andrew. That was amazing. Um, I really liked the uh, the Beaker demo at the end. That was really, really cool. Um, and uh, we got a lot of good comments from people in the chat, too. So great questions. You know, something I, I realized, the um, the platform we were using to send out um, the uh, calendar invite, it uh, crashed and went down, uh, like, during, like, right before the event started. So uh, the fact that we have 50 people watching right now um, on all the different platforms is actually incredible, given that, like, the hundred plus people who RCP didn't like the link didn't work from the email that it sent them. So uh, they found it on Twitter and got here anyway. So that's really cool. Uh, hopefully we don't have that problem next week. Um, cool. So um, what I want to uh, do now is explain a little bit about how the social happy hour part of the event will work. So what we're going to do now is 
Um, we're going to go to a uh, site called uh, speakeasy.co, which is different than the Speakeasy meetup that you're you're watching right now. And we're going to use this platform to uh, be matched up with other people who are watching the stream right now. And um, you're going to be shown an icebreaker question and uh, given a chance to chat for five minutes with uh, someone else who's at the meetup right now. And so we're trying to replicate the sort of social part of the meetup. Um, so that you'll have a chance to like actually meet some people, maybe make a friend, um, maybe uh, you know get a chance to talk with the speakers because the speakers are going to be um, in the chat as well. And uh, the call that you that you're matched into is going to end automatically after five minutes. So there's no pressure to keep talking after you know after five minutes. If you don't like who you're talking to, feel free to just uh, let the call end, and then it'll match you to somebody else, and you can uh, just mix with a lot of people that way. But uh, if you're having a really good conversation, there is an extend button that's going to show up in the last 15 seconds of the call that'll that'll allow um, you to keep talking if both people agree to. So um, yeah, so that's that's what we're going to try. Um, the URL is right here, so it's going to be uh, speakeasy.co/js. So I'm going to paste that into the chat here and. Uh, we're all going to head over there right now, so I'm going to end the stream in a couple seconds, and we'll um, we'll all be on speakeasy.co slash js for the social happy hour. So um, once again, thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, we'll see you all at uh, the happy hour. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Yeah, bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for watching.